thank you for taking the time to join us today for the Plus Group webinar series. Today's topic is A Taste of No More Selling and will be presented to you by Sam Richter. Sam is internationally recognized authority on sales training and relationship building programs. He was named by Inside View in both 2011 and 2012 as one of the top 25 most influential people in sales. His best-selling book, Take the Cold Out of Cold Calling, was named 2012 Sales Book of the Year. We're very happy to have Sam here joining us today. Please note that all lines will be muted during this webinar. If you'd like to ask a question, please go to the question pane on your control panel and type it in. We will answer the questions at the end of the webinar. Also note that we are recording this webinar. It will be sent to you along with the presentation and a follow-up email. You will also be able to view it on our website at www.plusgroupus.com. Now I'm going to turn this over to Sam. Hey, thanks so much, Tracy, and it's really an honor to be with everybody today. Thanks for taking time out of your day, and I'm going to fill your brains with a ton of material over the next uh, 40 minutes or so, and uh, as Tracy mentioned, we'll uh, gladly take questions at the end. And today we're going to talk, or give you a little bit of a taste of no more selling. So usually my program is presented around the globe to associations, custom companies. Mm -hmm. It can be anywhere from about an hour and a half. Uh, sometimes an hour keynote to about a six-hour interactive training. So I'm going to try to jam the most pertinent and fun parts into a 30 or so session. So the good news is even though the webinar is going to contain, oh, more than 100 slides in about 30 minutes, I've also prepared a reference guide for all of you. So everybody who attends today gets access to my reference guide, which will give you the step-by-step -step instructions on everything I'm going to talk about today and a whole lot more. And I'll give you uh, information at the end of the webinar on how to download the reference guide. So I think Stephen Shipman does a really nice job of summing up what we're going to talk about today. And that is that the key to successful selling, the key to successful business relationships, is really understanding other people. What do they care about? Why do they choose to do business the way they choose to do business? Why do they choose to do business with whom they choose to do business? What's going on in their world? And can we help them achieve their goals a little bit faster? Uh, maybe with a little bit higher quality than they might be able to achieve on their own. What we're really talking about is marrying all the great stuff that you want to say with what the buyer actually wants to hear. Because when we are able to marry with the what you want to say with what the buyer wants to hear, at that intersection is called relevance. And relevance is really where the sale occurs. Because at the end of the day, for any of you who have ever taken formal sales training, and I don't care. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Again, I don't care if you've uh, uh, taken formal sales training with Dale Carnegie or uh, value-based selling, uh, permission-based selling, provocative selling. All selling is based on the concept that you have to ask really meaningful questions. And questions like, tell me a little bit about your business or how big are you guys, that's not really a great question. A great question is, you know, I noticed that you're doing business a specific way and your competitors are doing it a different way. Why is that so? Or, I see that you're using this piece of technology. How's that working for you? Really understanding what's going on in the other person's world and asking relevant, meaningful questions. That's how you're able to get great answers and really engage on a deep, personal relationship level. Because at the end of the day, in sales, I don't care how much the Internet has changed selling. At the end of the day, people still buy from people that they like. People still buy from people that they trust. So what we're going to talk about today is again a taste of no more selling. I'm going to show you how you find the information to ask great questions. And we're going to talk a little bit about search engines, the invisible web, and even show you how to access big company resources so you can access those same tools at no charge. So Google. If you're like most people in business, you use Google as your favorite search engine. But if I were to ask you, you know, how important is Google to your business, scale of 1 to 10? Most of you would say 7, 8, 9, or 10. It's really important for you to be able to find information. But then if I would ask you, hey, show of hands, how many of you have ever gone through formal Google training on how to actually find information? I bet you, unless you went to library school, none of you have really learned how to use this amazingly powerful tool. Because it kind of showed up on your computer about 14, 15 years ago. And you type a couple things in, you get some great answers. And Google works most of the time. But it doesn't always find you exactly what you want 
the first time every time. So that's what we're going to talk about today for a little bit. So I'm going to put you through a little Google training, and we're going to start out in, say, Google Kindergarten. So for some of you, this might be a little bit basic, but I promise I'm going to get to the cool stuff pretty quickly. So what is Google? Well, Google is really nothing more than a big vacuum cleaner. So imagine this big vacuum cleaner going around the Internet, and what it's looking for are web pages with words on them. When Google finds a web page with words on it, it flips on the vacuum cleaner, sucks up those words, stores those words in a big vacuum cleaner bag. When you go into Google and type in one, two, or three words, all that's happening is Google saying, where do those three words appear most often on the Internet? And it delivers you a list of results. There's no human being sorting the information. There's no human saying that this site's better than the other. The ability to find good information is all based on the ability to enter in good information. What you might not know is effective Google searching is really a mathematical equation. The first one is plus. So if I want the word CEO and the word Minnesota, in every single one of my Google search results, I'm going to type in CEO plus Minnesota. Now, CEO could be in the first paragraph. Minnesota could be in the 40th paragraph. But both of those words must appear somewhere on the page. Now, the good news is you technically really don't need to type in plus. Because when Google sees that you've typed in two words, in a sense, Google types in the, word, the, the plus for you. So if you were to unwrap the code, you'd kind of see the plus sign. But it's important to know that that's how it works, as you'll see in just a couple of minutes. Another one is OR, in all uppercase. And how do you use this is if you want to expand your searching. Well, I'm looking for directors or managers. Not really sure which one. I type in OR in all uppercase. And I'm telling Google I want to find results with one or both of those terms. Now, the next super powerful one is the minus sign. What the minus sign does is it actually allows you to filter your search results. So let's take my daughter, for example. Her history teacher said, Maddie, I want you to write a, write, write a report on the Vikings, the guys from Norway from like 500 years ago. So she goes into Google. She types in Vikings like any kid does. And she gets a bunch of stuff, about 17 million search results on what? On the soon-to-be world champion Minnesota Vikings football team. Well, she doesn't want that. She wants the guys from Norway with the, the, the boats and the swords on their helmets, history dudes. So she could go in. To Google and type in like Vikings plus Norway plus history plus swords, or she could say, what word don't I want? Oh, I don't want the word football. So I'm going to take the minus sign, and I'm going to remove the word football from my search results. And you can do this like 30 times. So by using the minus sign, and the trick is the minus sign must be attached to the word that you want to remove, you can literally filter your search results. Now this next one is super important. It's quotation marks. When you use quotation marks, you're telling the search engine that the words within quotation marks must be in that exact order every single time. So if I'm going in and I'm looking for a person, say I'm looking for Karen Jane Anderson, if I just do it the normal way, Google's going to think that I mean Karen plus Jane plus Anderson. Remember what we just talked about when you go in and type in three words? Google thinks that you mean those three words, but in no particular order. Now, every single result has those three words but I get nearly 4 million search results. Every single one, Karen Jane Anderson is somewhere on the page, just not in the order that I want. A simple thing, like putting it in quotation marks, when the search engine sees that something's within quotation marks, it says, ah, you want to treat that like a single phrase. So anytime you're searching for a proper noun, name of a person, name of a company, or even a phrase like annual revenue, put it in quotation marks, you get much better results. So that was kind of, I suppose Google Kindergarten. How do we go beyond that? Let's kind of move into more advanced searching. It's where you take this math, so it's kind of a science is what you just learned, and apply the art to it. We're going to produce what's called a complex Boolean query. What I'm teaching you is called Boolean logic by a mathematician named George Boole. So let's say that I'm looking for decision makers at this software company in Minnesota. I'm going to tell Google, Find me web search results, and on every page, the phrase loss in software must be in there. The phrase vice president or the word director also must be in there. And the word Minnesota must be on every single page. Now, I use parens because it helps me think mathematically. But you really don't need to use the parens. Google will just ignore them. But again, what I'm telling Google is the phrase loss in software must be in there, the phrase vice president or the word director, and the word Minnesota. Now, when I run that search, I get some pretty good results, certainly better than if I just typed in loss in software. But there's a word that keeps popping up that I don't want. What is it? Remember, I'm looking for job titles. I want names of people at the company. 
and I keep getting job or employment listings. So all I have to do is go right back up into Google and do minus jobs, and it actually re will remove that word from the search results. And all of a sudden, I start to get the results that I'm interested in. Now, how many of you suffer from temporary amnesia? What do I mean? Well, have you ever gone to a, an industry event or a rotary meeting or a, a chamber of commerce meeting, a cocktail party, and you meet somebody and you say to yourself, wow, that person will be a really good connection, a great prospect, a potential employee. You want to go back and Google them, but you can't remember their name. Well, the good news is Google has a solution for it. Anytime you can't remember a piece of information, drop in an asterisk. It's called a wild card, and Google will fill in the blanks for you. So I met this guy. He works at Anderson something something and Associates. I can't remember the middle stuff. Instead of worrying about it, I type in the first name, I type in the last name, I put the whole thing in quotes because, again, I want to treat it like a proper noun. I drop in an asterisk where I'm missing the information, and Google fills in the blanks for me. How else can we use this? How about finding job titles? Google, find me all the vice presidents of something at 3M. Now I want to be clear. I'm not hacking into 3M's employee directory. That would be a way more expensive uh, webinar. But what I am looking for are web pages where job titles and names appear. So vice president of something at 3M, and Google fills in the blanks. Vice president of R&D, vice president of investor relations, internal operations, human resources, talent solutions, on and on and on. Let Google fill in the blanks for you. How about email addresses? How many of you would like to find email addresses? Well, think of this. For most companies, the email address is the same back end as their website address. What do I mean by that? If I work at Widget Corp, my website is probably www.widget.com. My email address is probably something like sam-richter widget.com or srichter at widget.com. So once I know your website address, which is obviously pretty easy to do, just go into Google, find the website address, using the something ask trick, usually find people's email addresses. So for example, if I want email addresses of people that work at Cargill, I know the website is cargill.com. I type in something at Cargill.com. Now the magic trick here is you've got to put the whole thing in quotation marks because we've got to treat it like a phrase. And again, we're not hacking into Google's, or excuse me, we're not hacking into Cargill's uh, email directory. What we're looking for are web pages where email addresses exist. And what we're really looking for is the naming convention. So you can see at Cargill, they use first name underscore last name at Cargill.com. So if I'm looking for Bill Smith, what's Bill's email address? It's most likely Phil underscore Smith at Cargill.com. So again, you can use this technique to figure out the information you need, and then doing a little deductive reasoning, you can probably figure out just about anybody's email address at the company. Now, I love this next thing. It's called Google, more or less. You've all seen it, but if you're like most folks, you have no clue what it is, or you never really use it. So I've got a sales call in about 10 minutes. I'm sitting in my car at the parking lot of the company. The company's name is Digital River. I figure, hey, I better go learn about this company before I walk in the door. So I type in Digital River within quotation marks. Because again, I want to treat it like a proper noun. But unfortunately, I get 1.3 million search results. Well, I don't have time to look at 1.3 million search results in the 10 minutes I have before my meeting. And frankly, if I click on their webpage, digitalriver.com, what am I really getting? I'm really, really all I'm looking at is their online brochure. So what do I do every time before a phone call? before I send out an email to a new prospect, before an in-person meeting. I do my Google search results, but then I look at the stuff over on the left-hand side. What is it? It allows me to sort my Google search results. Only show me videos with Digital River. Only show me pictures. What I like to click on before every meeting is news. Only show me recent news. I can find out what's going on at the company today. Maybe they hired somebody. Maybe they won an award. Maybe they launched a new product. Now, in this example, it's a pretty popular company, 38 results. I don't have time. I've only got like nine minutes now. Well, I can even sort my news results. Show me stuff from a few years ago, 10 years ago. How about 24 hours ago or even the last hour? So I can go in there and use that information and ask great questions, reference an article, reference a press release. Make the other person talk about something that you know they care about. When you're on a sales call and you can get the other person to talk about something you know they care about, that's where you can really get them to open up. And that's where you get invited to also share about you and your company. Get the other person to talk about something they're passionate about, which is usually themselves, 
and you can really start to build that relationship. Now, this next tip I really like. I call it looking for a file, or another way the CIA spy has of finding stuff online. Did you know that people have posted billions of files on the Internet? Literally billions of them. How do you find them? Well, you run your search, and then you do a file type colon search. And where I have why, why you replace that with the kind of file you're interested in. So what kind of Excel spreadsheets might be out there? How about membership lists, budgets? You type in file type colon XLS or file type colon XLSX. PowerPoint, PPT, those could be presentations by your competitors at conferences, Word documents, PDF files, those could be sales proposals. Let me give you a couple of examples. It's always fun to do this on large companies because I know I'm going to find some stuff. So I typed in Costco, file type colon XLS, huge 8,000 spreadsheets showed up. And I should let you know that what Google's doing is it's not only vacuuming up the title of the spreadsheet, it's literally opening up the spreadsheet or the PowerPoint document or the PDF file and vacuuming up every single word with inside that document, within the document, and all those words become searchable. So there are 8,320 Excel spreadsheets, and that will change obviously almost every minute as new people take stuff up and take stuff down, that have the phrase Costco inside. Let's click on one. Wow, look at this. Here's a list of all the main regions of Costco, every single product that's sold within Costco, and the full contact name and phone number, email address of the individual responsible for the sale of that product within Costco. Pretty cool stuff once you know how to find it. You can do other things. You can find lists, attorneys, Minneapolis, list, file type colon, XLS, a whole bunch of them appear. Here's an Excel spreadsheet of every attorney in the city of Minneapolis, full contact information, including direct office line and email address. Really cool when you know how and where to look. Now again, I've gone through just a few Google search tips, some of my favorites. There's obviously a lot more in my book and my video series. Uh, but I think I've given you the ones that, that I use most often. You're still probably sitting there going, okay, that was really cool, but I just want somebody else to do all the work for me. Well, Google can take care of that too, and it's completely free. Go out and get a Google Alert account. Go to google.com slash alerts. You go in and you set up your alert using the techniques we just talked about. So I've set up alerts on myself, my book, my company, uh, the companies where I serve on the board, all of my clients, all of my prospects. And anytime Google finds new information, it sends me an email. So Google does the work for me. So what I recommend is people open up two browser windows. Open up Google in one and do a complex Boolean search until the things that you start seeing, the results you start seeing, you're like, yeah, I want more of those. Copy that complex Boolean query, paste that into your Google Alert, and anytime Google finds new information related to your search, it'll send you an email. If it finds 10 things, it doesn't send you 10 emails. You tell Google how often you want it. I set mine daily. So every time Google finds something, once a day, I receive the new listings that Google found that day. So hopefully those are some cool Google search tips. Now let's talk about the invisible web. What is the invisible web? What most people don't know is there's literally trillions of web pages out there, but search engines actually get to a very small percentage. The rest is what's called the invisible web, or websites that for whatever reason Google can't fully vacuum up. Why can't Google fully vacuum up a web page? Well, there's lots of reasons, but one of the ones you can probably relate to is websites where you have to register for the information. Well, Google can't register. Now, there might be 100,000 articles, 100,000 pages after you register, but Google can't register. So those 100,000 pages are now on the invisible web, not accessible to search engines. The people that own that website don't.
hey, sorry about that. For some reason, my uh, phone actually stopped working. So hopefully everybody can hear me again now. Um, so anyhow, we were talking about the invisible web or websites that for whatever reason, people can't access. And we talked about why those might be invisible, uh, primarily because of uh, sites that you have to register. So let me give you a couple of my favorite invisible websites. Inside View. Inside View is a great invisible website. It's completely free. Now you have to register. You have to register to log in. Uh, but registration is free. And you can type in the name of a company. So here's one of the companies um, where I work, Actify. You get some basic information about the company, the size of the company, number of employees, what the company does. And you can even get some of the key executives. And what I really like is you can even click on the Buzz tab and find recent blog posts or recent tweets that people at the company have sent or that um, uh, people are even talking about the company. So Inside View is a really cool, invisible website that you might choose to use prior to a meeting, prior to even somebody picking up the phone and calling you while logging to Inside View while they're making their introduction so I learn a little bit about the organization. Another one I really like is Jigsaw or Data.com. Again, completely free. You create your registration, you log in, type in the name of the company, it gives you basic information of the company. But what it really does well, I think, is give you company contacts, because Jigsaw builds its database off of business cards. So people upload business cards to Jigsaw, and then it completes its database. Now, how does Jigsaw make its money? Well, if you click on any of the names in blue, you can buy the contact information, which might be a good idea, but frankly, we don't really need to, because I already showed you how we can find their email address. What I also like about Jigsaw, it will also tell you when people have changed titles and what are the most purchased contacts. Most purchased contacts, these would be names that other people are buying. Uh, those are probably the decision makers at the organization. You know, I showed you earlier about Google News. Well, sometimes you're going to be calling on companies that aren't going to show up in big newspapers. You know, they don't show up in the Wall Street Journal or USA Today or even their local dailies, but they do show up in their weeklies. So another really good news search engine, if you're not finding what you want in Google News, is mool.com slash media. So I was calling on a friend of mine, uh, tastefully simple. He, again, notice how I use my Boolean. I type in the uh, quotation marks. And it pulls up some great information. Now I'm notice I'm getting some questions on that the slides aren't advancing. So I'm not sure why that is. Um, try here again. Okay, I think might be working now. So mool.com slash media, let me back up a little bit. So what mool.com slash media does is again, it's that local search engine. So I type in tastefully simple, I use quotation marks, and then notice that the results are all from local newspapers. So again, it's not the big newspapers, because sometimes you're going to be calling on companies that just don't, again, their press releases, their news articles aren't going to show up in big newspapers, but they do show up in smaller newspapers. Mool.com slash media is a great source for that. Industry information. Now, we don't need to be experts in an industry, but we do need to be able to find basic information. You know, when we're calling on a company, it's important to know a little bit about their industry. What are their issues? Or what are the trends? Now, you could go into Google and type in plastics industry or auto, you know, auto glass industry, and what are you going to get? Well, you'll probably get a bunch of places that want to sell you plastic or auto glass. No, what I'm looking for is just a synopsis of the industry. I want some basic bullet point information. One of the sites I really like is business.hybeam.com slash industry reports, where I can log in. I can choose the industry that I'm interested in. It gives me a nice industry snapshot of what's going on in the other person's world. I can review this information five minutes prior to my meeting, ten minutes prior to my meeting, and I can have some good talking points. Because again, the key here on sales is you want to be relevant what the other person cares about. Now, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a super powerful and visible website. Most of you probably are already on LinkedIn. There's about 180 million business executives on LinkedIn, and it's estimated that new executives adding their LinkedIn profile every second of every day. So LinkedIn really allows you to build a network. Now, I'm going to show you how to search LinkedIn a little bit differently. So what I like to do, again, five minutes prior to any meeting, or even while somebody's on the phone with me, or even prior to sending an email, I want to learn a little bit about that individual so I can be relevant to the things they care about. So I'm calling on this guy, Todd Imholt. He works at an organization called Environmental Graphics. Notice how I search 
in LinkedIn. Todd at Moles within quotes. And I type in at environmental graphics. Put environmental graphics within quotes. Now, Todd M. Alt is not a lot of those, but let's say I was looking for Joe Smith. There's probably thousands of Joe Smiths. And by doing this, by typing in the name of the company in quotes along with the name of the person, you usually get the person's profile the first time, every time. So I can learn a little bit about Todd, where he went to school, his past jobs, some people who have him. I can even see the groups he belongs to and even some of his interests. He's into family, entrepreneurship, developing people, golf, and travel. How do I use that information? If I'm having an in-person meeting, I don't walk in and say, hey, you know, how's your golf game? That would be a little bit weird. But knowing this information, it might allow me to ask better questions. So for example, if it's a really nice day out and I go in and I'm meeting with Todd, I might say something like, geez, what a great day. And Todd might say, yeah, it sure is. And, I'm like, I, and now you have to be genuine. You have to be truthful here. But I might say, yeah, boy, I can't wait to get out on the golf course. Now again, that has to be true. If you don't know anything about golf, don't say that. But by asking that type of question, because we know that Todd likes golf, he's probably going to follow up with, oh, do you play golf? And I'll say, well, yes, I do. Do you? Well, I already know the answer to that question. And now I'm able to engage in a conversation that I know is important to him, something that he cares about. Now, here's the real power of LinkedIn for salespeople. It's the LinkedIn Advanced. It's right through the right in the people search form. I clicked on the Advanced tab. Now, notice how I'm using my Boolean. So LinkedIn. Find me every president or vice president or CEO or chief executive officer. I use the pull-down menu. That's their current job title. In charge of marketing or sales. Located within 50 miles of my house in the consumer goods industry. Now, seriously, prior to LinkedIn, how many vice presidents of marketing or sales located within 50 miles of my house in the consumer goods industry do you think I knew? And that answer would be zero. But according to LinkedIn, there are 377 people that perfectly fit my profile. So LinkedIn is an amazing tool for really targeting in the exact type of person, the exact decision maker that you want at companies. Now you're sitting here and going, well, that's well a bit. I can't always find people that way. There's other ways you can do it as well. Just because LinkedIn says you have to enter in the job title in the title field doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So notice how I type in compensation or incentives, OR and all uppercase, and then I type in my job title over in the keyword area. I'm looking for vice presidents in charge of compensation or incentives in the computer software industry. Now I get 270 results. So we get pretty cool stuff, really neat ways to build your list. Now, you might be saying, oh, that's great, Richter. You've got like 5 billion or 50 billion or whatever number of contacts I have. I don't know what I have. And it's certainly in the tens of millions. You might have 10, and you don't get results. Every time you go into LinkedIn and you type in a name, or oftentimes when you run a search like that, you get job titles. Every time you click on the job title, we can ask you to upgrade to the premium service. Now, quite frankly, you might want to upgrade to the premium service. If you're a person that really likes to generate leads and find information, you know, buying the LinkedIn premium service is pretty good. I, I don't, by the way. I don't have it. I just use the free stuff. Because what I do is anytime I get a job title on LinkedIn, I take my mouse and I highlight the job title. And then I go up and I choose copy. I right mouse click and choose copy. And I go into Google and I choose paste. I paste the job title directly into Google. And the magic trick is I've got to put that in quotation marks. So highlight the job title on LinkedIn, paste it into Google, put it within quotation marks, and Google will actually give you the person's name. So you can use LinkedIn to go find the individuals that you want to call on. And even if you're not connected with them at any level, you can highlight the job title, right mouse click copy into Google, put the whole job title within quotation marks, and nine times out of ten, Google will actually give you the person's name. Now, I've shown you how you can use Google, how you can use the Invisible Web. Really cool tools to find some great information. Again, just a smattering, just a little bit of the stuff that I normally cover in my training, in my book, my videos, those kinds of things. But again, probably my favorites. But even with this, you don't have the best information. What is the best information? Well, the best information is oftentimes locked up in super expensive databases. Big databases, the big companies are paying big time dollars to access. You've heard the names. Dun & Bradstreet, Value Line, Morningstar, Sales Genie, newspaper databases, trade journal databases. That's not fair. Why do the big companies just spend a lot of money to get access to this stuff and we get whatever we can find online? Well, did you know that all of you have access to super expensive databases as well? And they're completely 
free. Where? How do you get it? How many of you have been to this place in the last year? Your local public library. And how many of you have been there for business information? Again, what can you find? Well, every public library in the country is a little bit different. But all of them subscribe to premium databases, list building databases, newspaper databases, trade journal databases, so every newspaper in the world from today's issue going back 50 years, most major trade journals from you know, thermoplastics digest to Harvard Business Review from today's issue going back 50, sometimes 100 years I've seen them. Completely free, completely searchable at your public library. And the best thing is you really need to go to your public library one time. When you're there, you'll pick up a piece of plastic. It's called a library card. Most of you have it in your wallet right now. Many of you do. Once you have your library card, then go find your public library website. Here's mine, Hennepin County in Minneapolis. Now again, every public library website is going to be a little bit different. But all of them will have a link called databases or online resources. Find it. Click on it. And see what kind of high-end premium subscription databases you have access to 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, completely for free via your own home or work computer because you have a library card. And I keep saying for free, they're not really free. Every April 15th, you pay for them. You're just not taking advantage of them. So you too have the access to the same super powerful information sources as big companies do as long as you have and make use of that library card. So again, that was just a taste of no more selling, how to find information. Didn't talk too much how to use information, but touched on it a little bit. Hopefully it was helpful to you. Let me leave you a couple of gifts. If you need to reach me, pretty simple. That's honestly my contact information. If you ever do training with somebody who talks and says that they're an expert on the internet and that's not their contact information, I'd be a little bit nervous. But again, you can go in and easily find me via Google if you need information. If you have a Facebook account, I'd love you to like me on Facebook. Now, I'm not going to tell you what I had for breakfast this morning, but I will keep you up to date on the latest search techniques and also privacy issues. We didn't talk about personal privacy today. That's something I normally do discuss. Uh, but I will keep you up to date on my Facebook page. If you'd like to download the reference guide, here's the web address. And I'll put this up at the end of the webinar as well. But it's samrichter.com slash kmguide. You can download my reference guide. It's completely free. You'll be registering for my newsletter. So you can, I'll stay in touch with you. And you can keep up to date on search techniques and, again, privacy issues. You also get access to my toolbar, which is completely free. You can share it with everybody at your company. And what I do here is I take the best online information sources and put them right on your browser. So this is a toolbar that bolts onto your browser. It takes about 10 seconds to install. If you don't want to, it takes about 10 seconds to uninstall. I've got tens of thousands of users around the world. And I really, well, my goal is to make what I share with you hopefully easy and maybe even a little fun. So will your business be better now that you have access to better information? If you want to get the full instruction, you can go to my website. Uh, take the cold.com. You can go to Amazon. You can find my book. It's now in its ninth edition. Just updated a couple of months ago. So you'll find all the step-by-step -step instructions with tons of examples on how to practice everything I shared with you today. If you're someone who just likes to learn via video, I've taken my full three-hour training program and made it into three videos. How to search, how to develop lead lists and referrals, and how to really prepare for a sales call. You can go to samrichter.com slash kmvideo and learn more on that. So again, don't forget to download the reference guide. It will give you the step-by-step -step instructions for today. Thank you very much for hanging with me. I really apologize for the technical issues we were having. don't really know why that happened. I give uh, literally probably 50 webinars a year, and that's the first time that's happened, so I apologize for that. But hopefully everyone still found value in today's program. Thank you.